Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. A seed planted today takes root and grows into a tree that bears fruit in the future. Over 110 years ago, a seed was planted. Today, that seed, the idea of excellence, has grown into the University of Pretoria, South Africa's largest contact research-intensive university. Nine faculties and a business school are spread across seven beautiful campuses, which are home to over 50,000 students, ready to make an impact in the world beyond university and join our global network of nearly 300,000 alumni. Future-focused, sustainably developed facilities and cutting-edge multi- and transdisciplinary research are underpinned by a desire to transform lives and have a positive impact on communities and the world. Excellence in teaching, learning, research innovation, arts and culture and sports puts us firmly amongst the world's best universities. Knowledge is not just what is in books, it is the wisdom to apply it, to nourish and nurture the seed so that it takes root, grows tall, bears fruit and branches out. UP plants that seed that tiny bit of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, hope, the desire to care, respect, help, and innovate against all odds, to grow, to leave your mark, to excel, to challenge the norm, to think, to rethink, to discover, to inquire, to lead, to have courage, to make a difference, and to persevere. This is the University of Pretoria. We make today and every day matter. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tian de Jager, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria. I will be your program director for this 26 UP expert lecture presented by Professor Vanda Markotter. It is, however, my privilege to introduce our VC and principal to you, who will do the official welcome and introduction. Professor Tuana Kupe is the vice chancellor and principal of the University of Pretoria. He has a BA honors and Masters in English from the University of Zimbabwe, as well as a DPhil in Media Studies from the University of Oslo uh, in Norway. In December 2019, Michigan State University awarded Professor Coupe an honorary doctorate in Humanities. <coughs> Professor Coupe was also recently appointed as an international council member of the International Association of Media and Communication Research. It is my honor to welcome Professor Tuana Coupe. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 26th UP Expert Lecture to be presented by Professor Vanda Makota. The Expert Lecture at UP is an occasion where experts in their own fields share with colleagues and the general public the insights, knowledge, and analysis from their expertise. Today, we are going to listen to Professor Vanda Makota, and I'm going to give you a very short abstract of what she's going to say, and then also read her CV. Her short bio, rather, the CV might take us the whole day and deprive us of the lecture. The COVID-19 outbreak has resulted in the most devastating global pandemic in modern history. Wildlife species, including birds, are suggested to have played a role in spillover events. Significant global surveillance has been conducted among bed populations for more than a decade with the aim of assessing and understanding specifically coronavirus diversity, preventing spillover opportunities, 
and preparing for future emerging viruses. Despite these efforts, the COVID-19 pandemic happened. So how ready are we when it comes to predicting pandemics? And what needs to change in order to guide future studies and pandemic preparedness? To answer these questions and to take us through this journey of understanding is Professor Vanda Makota, virologist, began her academic career at the University of Pretoria in 2004 and is currently the director of his Center for Viral Zoonosis in the Department of Medical Virology at the University's Faculty of Health Sciences. In January 2016, she was awarded the Chair in Infectious Diseases, Zoonosis, by the DSIR, which is Department of Science and Innovation, National Research Foundation, South African Research Chairs Initiative. Professor Makota has been involved in a multidisciplinary research program on disease ecology in bird species in South Africa and other African countries since 2005. Her research includes extensive fieldwork that focuses on birds and potential spillover hosts, virological testing, bird biology, ecological investigations, and human behavior studies. The focus is not only to detect viruses, but to understand the factors involved in spillover and to develop mitigation strategies. More than 40 postgraduate students have graduated under her supervision, and she has mentored several postdoctoral fellows and emerging researchers. For Professor Makota has published more than 70 scientific publications and several book chapters, and regularly contributes to public media forums. Her research is supported by several multi collaborative international surveillance programs, including the Global Disease Detection Program, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Defense and Threat Reduction Agency in the United States of America. She also plays a leading role in several governmental committees, including the National Rabies Advisory Group and the National One Health Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor Vanda Makota, Professor Vanda Makota, your audience today. So thank you and um, good afternoon to all the attendees, but also good morning because we've got some attendees from other continents who are in a different time zone, and it's such a pleasure to present this lecture today. And I have to thank Prof. Coupe for the opportunity to stand here and present on a topic that became very relevant in the current COVID pandemic. Um, this uh, presumed link to wildlife, and that is what I will focus on today, on can we really prevent pandemics in the future by focusing on what we think the source of some of these outbreaks are. So I'm going to start with where we are in terms of COVID. I think we all know we're in a pandemic and it's really a large pandemic. And if you look at some of the recent data on 4 November, there's been over 47 million cases, um, confirmed cases. This means it was confirmed in a lab and over 1.2 million deaths. Um, and I think looking at these, these uh, amounts, we know that we're in a real pandemic at the moment. And there's certain countries that are feeling the pandemic more than other countries, as you can see by the map and the darker colors indicate more cases. Some countries have a lighter color with reporting lesser cases. And what's quite also important to realize is looking at the figure at the side, we, we're not out of it yet. So this is just showing the amount of cases that are still reported weekly. And you can see that although some continents have sort of a baseline that didn't change much, there's continents like Europe that's still increasing, continents like um, the um, Americas that's almost at the same level, but also some increases, and the Eastern Mediterranean and some of the other continents, Southeast Asia, that's also still reporting quite a lot of cases. So this is where we are, but if we look at this, we also need to look at the history of other outbreaks. So let's look at the last 50 years, and I just want to highlight a few things with some of these outbreaks that we saw. Not all of them were pandemics, to the extent that we're seeing with COVID-19, but 
th there's certain factors that we need to look at in the history that can direct our future and how we will deal with this in the future. So if you look at the last 50 years, specifically um, Marburg virus, um, it originated in Africa. Um, we think there's a link with bats. There's quite good evidence that there's a link with bats. And there's been about 478 deaths with several outbreaks still happening sporadically throughout the African continent. Then Ebola also um, originated on the African continent. There's a presumed link with bats, so we see the virus in bats, but we don't have clear evidence that it's linked to the, the human outbreaks at this point. And the outbreak that we probably all still remember is the 2014-2016 outbreak in West Africa, which was responsible for most of the deaths that you see recorded there. And we still see Ebola deaths, um, Ebola outbreaks, um, originating on the African continent sporadically now and then, just popping up and then um, getting it under control again. Then there's Nipah that we see basically in Malaysia, also now in a broader distribution like India, um, also associated with bats. And then SARS coronavirus, which was the outbreak in 2002, that also originated in China. It then spread worldwide due to travel, but it was brought under control quite quickly. And again, I've put question marks there. We think there's a link with bats because we see related viruses in bat species. There was also the palm civets that were involved in the story. And I will talk a little bit more about this when I go into more detail on coronaviruses. And then we've got all the flu viruses, the influenza. So we saw the bird flu H5N1. They've all got different names depending on their characteristics that originated in China, spread worldwide. Um, over 800 deaths. We've got MERS-related of MERS coronavirus that's currently still um, circulating, but in a very distinct area in the Middle East. It originated in Saudi Arabia. Um, we're still seeing about over 800 deaths. And then all the flus, um, H7N9, H1N9, and the seasonal flu. And if you look at the cases with the last two, um, H1N9, and seasonal flu, there's been a lot of cases, but the fatality rate is so low that the deaths is not near what we're seeing with COVID in a very short period of time. So we think the case fatality rate with, with COVID, with SARS coronavirus 2, is about 2.2%, but there's a huge amount of cases. And this is only lab confirmed, leading to a significant amount of fatalities worldwide. So if you look at this, um, there's a few factors that we need to, to highlight. One of the things that we're seeing, if we look at the history, is that the frequency of outbreaks are increasing. We're seeing more outbreaks in the last 10, 15 years. We also, um, we, it's more severe. And there's reasons for this. The population is exploding. Um, we've got a much higher human population. That means there's close contact. There's more um, opportunities for diseases to spread. We also know that most of these diseases come from an existing microbial diversity. So it's not like this diversity is new. This diversity has been in nature forever. There's reasons why we're now seeing it spilling over to humans and, and other animals. And it's, it's quite mind-boggling if you look at these amounts that people are predicting. This is prediction. So some studies predict that there's still 1.7 million undiscovered viruses just in mammalian and avian hosts, and that half a million of these can actually spill over. So if you start looking at these predictions, it's really important to look at why spillover is happening. And if you look at my last point on this slide, it's due to contact with wildlife, livestock, and people. And I'll talk a little bit about the factors that, that have an influence. The other thing is we see it's mostly viruses. There's also some bacterial diseases and some fungal diseases, but it's mostly viral, and mostly what we call the RNA virus group. So the RNA viruses are known to be mutating, so they can easily adapt to a new host and actually infect other species. And then the majority is zoonosis, spillover from an animal host. So what do we know? And this is going a little bit through the literature. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we know in general in the literature, and then I will focus more on coronaviruses and also bring in some of the research that we're actually doing um, in my group in collaboration with other people. So can we really say hotspots? Where are the next disease going to emerge? Are we at that point where we know 
this is a high risk area or this is a low risk area because we can't go and sample all over the world or focus everywhere to try and prevent spillover from wildlife. So specifically this study by Alan et al looked at wildlife um, spillover, so it specifically focused on wildlife. And they basically looked in the, the top map, they looked at where are we reporting outbreaks. Okay, obviously there's a risk if you're reporting an outbreak from a certain area. But then they went a little bit further to try, try and create a map that shows risk, not just on reporting, because we may not report, but based on risk factors. And that is what is um, in the table on the side that really indicates human activity, animal activity, or animal characteristics more, the environment, and how these factors actually influence disease, disease emergence in the last few decades. And specifically things like um, tropical forests come out on top. Now it's not just about the forest. If, if the forest is intact and the forest is there, it's fine. But the moment you have land use changes in these areas, this becomes a risk. The population of humans, where there's more humans, there will be more contact. And then mammal biodiversity always becomes an important factor. And then they created the map at the bottom and you, you can probably not see very clearly but if you look, those dots are all over the continent. And if you, even if you want to bring it back to South Africa, you can see on the coastal part and the northern parts of South Africa, we also have high-risk areas considered for disease emergence. <coughs> okay, so species. So there's species that's special, that's going to create the next outbreak. And this is a very big debate, actually. So there's been um, papers out in the earlier years that said bats were special, then later on people said in more recent papers it's not like that. So there's basically three reasons why people will say a specific group, the, the thinking behind it is important. The one is phylogenetic distance to humans. So if it's more closely related to humans, we would propose that there's a bigger chance of spillover. This is typically true for your primate groups. Then if you look, for instance, um, it can be a specific characteristic of an animal that can lead to spillover, and this has been implicated with bats specifically, where we say bats have got these unique immune systems, unique metabolism, unique physiological characteristics that makes them just very good reservoir hosts for, for diseases and or for pathogens that can then spill over. And then there's this new paper that said, the one in the middle, that said this is, none of this is true. Um, it's all about species diversity, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about this. And it's actually quite important to look at um, these papers because a lot of the biosurveillance and surveillance studies and planning studies and decide what to do is built on some of this information in the literature. So if you do it having the idea in mind that bats are the most important, your whole study are gonna be skewed to, towards bats. If you think it's only phylogenetic relatedness, your study is going to be skewed towards that. So it's really important that we start re-looking at what the data is actually telling us from the history that we know and the information we have. So this is from this Melensa and Stryker paper, and basically they re-looked at all the literature. Um, and there's some complicated graphs here, but I'll try and just simplify it. So they went and they looked in the literature, all the viruses that's been reported from different taxons of animals. You would see rodentias there, coropteras there, primates is there. And basically the color, the darker the color, it shows that there was a zoonotic event, which means it did spill over to humans. So the first point you should see here, very few zoonotic events in the bigger picture. If you look at all these taxa, there's very few dark, dark, um, purple, bluish kind of blocks. Then if you look at the viruses, the block indicates how many reports, and you would see there's lots for rodents, there's a bit of a, a smaller amount for the bats, but then there's very specific virus families associated with specific taxons, which is quite interesting. So it's not like arena viridae is important in coroptera, which is your bats. It's important in the rodents. Then they, they thought about this when they saw this, and they said, what does this mean? Because we keep on saying bats harbor the most number of zoonotic viruses. And if you look in the, in the corner bottom, you will see they then count all the number of zoonotic events. Yes, and then rodents are quite high, bats are quite high, 
But if you then go and normalize this data with the amount of species diversity in rodents and the amount of species diversity in bats, you get quite a different picture that's on the right-hand side or probably on your left-hand side, where rodents, primates, bats, and even your groups like um, your, your avian species all basically have the same risk of having a potentially zoonotic virus. And they then went further and they said, let's test this more because this is different from what other studies found. And they looked at all these factors again and again and again and look at virus characteristics wherever they could get that information, virus taxonomy, um, the things like publication efforts, so basically effort in sampling, phylogenetic distance. And that, although they could sort of get a, a link with phylogenetic distance um, of animals and risk of spillover, when they did some other uh, mathematical modeling analysis, this didn't hold. Um, and it was really just to do with the amount of species per taxon which gives you a higher proportion of number, uh, number of viral species and a higher proportion of those will be zoonotic. Not a very difficult um, concept, but that is what the data is showing. Then they did this for all the different groups, and um, they looked at publication effort. Is this skewing our data? Didn't come out as a, they could um, normalize that. It wasn't a, a big issue, phylogenetic distance but it was reservoir species richness, which has got to do with the diversity that came out as a really important factor. And then at the bottom of the B figure, you will see mammalian reservoir also came out, thanks, also came out as a, um, an important factor. And this was quite interesting because they then looked, is there, for instance, is avian species also important? And this is, because there's more mammalian species, not because mammalian species ne necessarily have more zoonotic viruses. You've got the same amount in proportion in avian species looking at the diversity of viruses that can spill over. So this is some of the previous studies that, that told a different story. Basically what came out here, bats are special. Bats are what's gonna be responsible for all our outbreaks in the future because of the way um, their physiological characteristics, their life traits and all of that. And then the phylogenetic distance also is important in terms of primates and then where there's people. Now, looking at this, again, coming back to the point that this is important to look at because most of our biosurveillance up to now have been very skewed towards bats because of the re some of the reasons I explained here, because we think bats has been responsible or are going to be responsible for most of our disease outbreaks. However, this information and some of these new analysis tells us that we should rather look at biodiversity. Now, biodiversity is a more complex thing to look at because it doesn't mean general biodiversity worldwide. It may be different for South Africa in a specific area, so how are you gonna plan your wildlife surveillance around that? So it becomes more complicated than just choosing one species. And then the other thing that came out in this study that I haven't highlighted yet is that viral characteristics are actually important because there's certain viruses that spill over um, in terms of, of um, specific taxons that they associated with, the phyloviruses with bats and um, all of that. So it's important that we also look at the viral characteristics and that's been something that's been very neglected. We, we go out, we test animals, we report on diversity of viruses, but we don't take that extra step to really characterize it properly. We don't take that extra step to look at some infection studies. Can it infect humans? Can it infect animals? And we can do that in a lab-based cell culture system. And then also looking at how we can have better diagnosis for these diseases and ultimately test it against the existing treatments and vaccines. So the one thing that was completely neglected in all of these studies looking really at risk is anthropogenic changes. So um, I know some of my colleagues always say, wildlife do not cause diseases. It's actually anthropogenic changes that we as humans cause that's causing disease emergence. We've got this diversity in, in wildlife, but it will never emerge if there's no human interaction or uh, an influence on the environment. Okay, uh, so what is the issue here? It, it's a lot, a lot to do with land use changes. 
which has got to do with agricultural expansion, intensification. It's different in different regions. Another thing that, that came up a lot with COVID that's a, a point of debate, wildlife trade, legally, illegally, there's different routes that this happen. Consumption, um, the, the disruption of natural interactions between wildlife and the pathogens or the viruses, which create opportunity for spillover. If, if we don't have these interactions, that opportunity will not be, uh, be there. And then climate change, um, sometimes indirectly. So if there's climate change, you may have animals moving from one area to another area, and there's then contact with people, animals. And if there's vectors involved, it obviously also have an effect if there's climate change. So it leads to increased contact. And then biodiversity loss is one of the themes that, cross across, that cut across all of this um, in several um, ways, because it changes the landscape, it changes the contact, it changes food security and all those aspects. So getting to coronaviruses, um, so what, what do we know about coronaviruses and how can that actually direct the future? So coronaviruses, I think if, if you were following the media and the news, you know we're not talking about one coronavirus. There's hundreds of them. And this, this picture just explains how many hosts can be infected. It's humans, it's wildlife, it's pets, um, it's pigs, it's livestock, camels, um, birds, bats, plays a very um, big role in the diversity. I've put a picture there, no snakes. You will remember at the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak, there was this report that snakes are involved. Um, there hasn't been any virological data of a coronavirus in a snake. So this very complicated genetic um, comparison of coronaviruses, but this is how we decide something is related. And I wanted to just point out a few things here. So if you look at the, the bluish Sebeca virus group, you will see there's in pink a human SARS coronavirus, that's the 2002 outbreak, and then there's a human SARS coronavirus 2, which is the COVID outbreak. You will see they're not the same virus. They're in the same general genus, but they're not the same virus, they're in different groups. And then what's important, look at what's all in between. There's bats, there's Chinese um, bats, the rhinolophus is the horseshoe bats, and then there's even some African bats where we detected virus in this specific group. And then there's the, the civets, there's the pangolin story is in, in this group. So they're all in this related group. Then we've got lots of other genera that I can just highlight quickly. The one in green at the bottom is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS, which we now spread between humans, camels are involved. Again, there's some more distantly related bat viruses, specifically in Africa and um, Asia, associated with this slide. And then if we go to the Norbeka viruses at the top, you will see there's an HKU virus and the Mbeka viruses, there's OC43, HKU1. Now this is all weird names, but basically what all of this is is endemic flu viruses that's circulating in the human population. And you will see with, it doesn't cause, cause very severe disease, you won't even probably know if you had it, if you didn't go for a specific test but it's all in between some of the wildlife species and related viruses that we find in wildlife. And this will be the same with even the other, the alpha coronavirus um, genus. We again have some endemic viruses with some bat viruses in between. And what's quite interesting with this, the two in red, pinkish red, 2 to 9E and NL63, most of the related viruses are actually associated with bats in Africa. It's related, very important to understand the word related because it's not the same viruses, um, but they are in the same group with these human viruses. So what we know, and this is because we've sampled bats extensively, is that there's just this high diversity of coronaviruses in bats. If you go and test, you'll find a coronavirus. And a lot of time it will be a new diversity that you're detecting. And this all started with the first, the SARS outbreak in 2002, where we didn't know where SARS came from. People started looking, and about three years later, a related virus was identified in a Chinese horseshoe bat, the Rhinolophus um, genus. And then that went on and on and on, and it just exploded worldwide in terms of coronavirus surveillance in bats. And that's how we now have this picture on the slide 
where there's basically reports from all over the world, very much focused on bats, with only recently starting to include rodents and some birds, and also seeing a diversity in those groups of viruses. So let's go back to the outbreaks and what we need to understand. So if we look at the first outbreak, and it, it's important to look at this because there's been so many similar things between the 2002 SARS outbreak and what we're seeing now with the SARS-2 SARS coronavirus, the COVID um, disease outbreak. So again, with SARS in 2002, life mark, animal markets were closely related with the outbreak. Um, again, there was cases that was linked to the market, cases that were not linked to the market, but there was some link. Then when they went and looked at animal handlers, which have close contact with, with the animals in the markets, there was some seropositivity. Um, they tested the animals in the market and palm civets tested positive. And what's interesting, what's not mentioned here is also raccoon dogs. There was a few raccoon dogs that also tested positive. And I'll come back to that point on, on one of my slides. The civets were culled because they were Im implicated in this disease transmission. But then when they started testing um, farm civets, because civets are farmed um, in the specific environment in China, they could not find any evidence of the virus. So it seems like it didn't come from the wild. It was introduced into the mo in the market, also into the civets. Um, and they were not the reservoirs of, of this virus. So they now sort of considered an intermediate host that also plays a role, but they have to get it from somewhere else. And then this whole history went on and on for years where bats were sampled. Um, Rhinolophus bats were present in these markets. We have some data on that, present in restaurants. They could detect antibodies. And for long, the viruses detected in these bats were very different from the one that we saw in humans. But in 2013, there was a virus reported also from Chinese horseshoe bats that was quite closely related. And what was quite significant with this detection is that the receptor of this virus could bind to human cells. The ones before this, we couldn't get to enter human cells in experimental conditions or by doing modeling and looking at the sequences of these receptors. So this is actually where we are with that outbreak. So we know it's in the bats, related viruses. We saw it in civets. There was also some raccoon dogs positive, but we have no idea how this interface happened. Was it the markets? How did it get to humans? Was it directly from bats? Was it from bats to civets? And that's actually still where we are. Um, more than 15 years later after SARS. SARS disappeared. We never saw the virus again, but we saw a new virus in 2019 that's similar. So this is where we are with COVID. Um, I told you when we were looking at the trees, um, the genetic trees, that they're not the same. They're 80% different on nucleotide levels. So it's not the same virus, but they're part of the same bigger group. And were the markets involved? Again, there's this hint towards the markets. How were they involved? We're not exactly sure. So environmental swaps were taken from these markets. They were positive. These swaps were not linked to specific animals. So there was virus in the markets, but was it just a place where people got exposed or was that the origin? And um, the markets were closed. There's several other problems. Um, some animals are illegally traded. So you, you don't really get a proper list of, of what was present in these markets. And then the pangolin story came out where pangolins tested positive um, and it was a virus that's also related to what we're seeing currently in humans, but, but quite distant, still 85 to 92% um, similarity. So it's not the same virus, but that gave us sort of an idea that we should look at other species also. And then there was SARS coronavirus 2 sequences from bats that was similar. And what's quite interesting, these sequences, the, it wasn't done now during the outbreak. It was data that was in research groups. Nobody thought it was important because it was not SARS. It was a bit different from SARS. So everybody was so focused, and that's maybe one of the lessons on what we knew in the past, and we thought that's what we're going to see again in the future, but then it was a completely different virus that caused the next severe outbreak. 
And this is just to show um, the viruses that we find in bats, the viruses in pangolins. The viruses in bats are more closely related to what we're seeing in humans than the pangolin virus. So the pangolins may play some role. We, not, we don't know how or what, where or when, but the bat viruses are more closely related to the human ones. So to, the map in the top corner it's just something I want to show. So Wuhan is at the top, but if you look at where the pangolins were sampled, where the bats were sampled, it's not at all in the same area. So this is just giving us information that we can probably work with to do more directed surveillance of what really happened if the source of the outbreak was in Wuhan. But it wasn't done in that exact same area. So there's lots of question marks. What we do now, we know we've got a, a virus in humans, spreading between humans and humans. We know we've got related viruses in bats, related viruses in pangolins, what those transmission cycles are. If that is actually the only two animals we must look at, we, we, we actually don't know. Um, and we hope that in the future we will solve some of those questions. So getting to Africa, I've showed those disease hotspot maps. We also need to look at other continents. It's, it's not like the areas where COVID happened is the only areas that's high risk. And this is just years ago, um, the group of um, Muller did a study where they looked at antibodies in bats, and we could see there's some coronavirus antibodies in bat species, but then nothing was done for years. And then some of the work we did and some colleagues, we started looking at coronaviruses in Africa and through the PREDICT program, and we could identify SARS-related, MERS-related, and some of the endemic um, human virus related viruses in bats. But basically what these maps are telling you, the gray is where we have data. So we've done very little in Africa actually to really say what our risk is. And then the dots is where we find these bat species. They're all over the region. And we again, we've got horseshoe bats that's associated with source related. And we've identified in Kenya and Rwanda some of these related viruses in bats. What I want to get to is, is bat diversity. So we've got more than 1,400 bat species worldwide. And it, it keeps on growing as we split um, species. If we look at Africa, several of these families occur in Africa, including the rhinolophidae, which is the horseshoe bats that's implicated in SARS coronaviruses. And this is just a summary by one of my postdocs. So if you look at the families tested for bat coronaviruses, We've tested a lot of families, but if you really look at, for instance, coronaviruses, the rhinolophidae that's important, and this is throughout Africa, data that's available in the public domain. We've only tested a little bit more than 700 bats for coronaviruses in the horseshoe bats, which is very, very little. Um, it's been skewed completely towards the fruit bats, which is the first family, the Therapodidae, and there's reasons for that. In, in Africa, we focus on the phyloviruses, the Bola and Marburg for years. So people used retrospective opportunistic samples just to test for coronaviruses. There wasn't specifically designed studies to really look at risk and look at high risk species. It was, it was done very opportunistically. So in the region, we actually still need to do a lot of work in terms of biosurveillance. So we know there's this um, diversity of source related coronaviruses. We, we've got sort of an idea in Africa, there's a few of them. Um, we definitely don't know everything. One of the big limitations is that we're not characterizing these viruses properly. It's small genetic sequences. We cannot determine from that short sequence how the receptor of the virus look. Will it actually infect cells? Um, we cannot make any of those predictions, and that's a big limitation that needs to be addressed. If you look at the study of Melenza and Stryker, where viral characteristics are probably also important, the virology is also very important in how that's done. We know we haven't seen any human outbreaks on, on the continent. Um, it can be missed, but we haven't seen large outbreaks. We have no, absolutely nothing about other wildlife species. We've been so focused on bats on the continent, and it's, it's been true for most of the world, actually, that we didn't include other wildlife. Susceptible species and intermediate hosts, nothing has been done. Um, and it's very important that, that we understand that even though we've got this diversity, there needs to be opportunity for spillover. So we really need to move from just detecting 
to understanding the factors leading to spillover. So just three, thing, three studies that I wanted to highlight going back to source corona, coronavirus, the 2002 outbreak. So there was a few flags that we should have seen. One of them was that we, we tested palm civets in those markets. They were positive. We the palm civets were killed. But there was also a few raccoon dogs that was positive. And we never really did. Anybody went back and really looked at raccoon dogs in detail after the outbreaks and these intermediate hosts and trying to see what this interface can be. And there's a recent paper, it's, it's actually still a preprint by the German group, where they went and did experimental infections of source coronavirus 2 in raccoon dogs. And they could see that they can be infected, they can actually transmit the virus to other raccoon dogs, showing that they, sh they should be watched as a species that can be a potential intermediate or susceptible host. And this is quite significant because raccoon dogs are formed in wildlife forms in, in these areas. So there's high amounts of, of these animals around. And then there was this paper, one paper, where there was a hint that there was serological evidence of SARS-related coronavirus infection in humans in China that has contact with bats. And th this was sort of in the literature. Nobody really went further and flagged this as a possibility that there can maybe be direct spillover from bats to humans in some of these areas. And then the big questions that none of us have really answered is understanding the factors of emergence. Animal markets keep on popping up. It, it may be controlled, it may be uncontrolled, there may be legal aspects, there may be illegal aspects. Same with animal trade. We just haven't looked at these interfaces properly or try and really put in practical preventative measures to look at this. A, a good example is, for instance, um, avian surveillance to look at influenza spillover, where poultry um, farms and poultry markets are well regulated. Um, there's um, testing of those areas to see if there's mixing of viruses, what's going to come out of it. There's certain regulations of not mixing certain species. So it's not necessarily always an answer of ban everything, but there needs to be some way that we can bring down the risk of spillover with these high-risk interfaces. Wildlife farming is also becoming a big issue where um, animals are formed, and then there's obviously mixing with domestic animals, mixing with humans, which is creating that interface. The direct contact with bats and then land use changes that's again linked to biodiversity that can be different for different regions. So we have sort of a broad idea, we've got issues, there's deforestation, but do we really know on the ground where these issues are and where it overlaps with potential disease emergence? Um, we, we're not at that point um, in most of the continents where we've done these type of work. So asking the question on can wildlife biosurveillance save us from the next pandemic, it's an important part. Um, we know we've got this diversity. We know there's this diversity in wildlife that's probably going to spill over if there's a uh, chance. So we need to watch that. We, we need to test animals, but do we only need to test bats? I think it's becoming more clear that it needs to be a bigger picture. You can't test everything in an ecosystem, but you can make a, a predictive assessment of, of what needs to be tested. And going back again to, to the Melenza paper, look at biodiversity, because if there's more biodiversity, there will be more vital species, and look what is the higher biodiversity in that area to decide on, on how to design biosurveillance. And then biosurveillance is not just testing, putting the sequence out there, and that's the end. It really also goes further into virology and into molecular characterization of pathogens. So that we can have an idea of which are the ones that we need to look at, which are the ones that's got a receptor that's similar to a receptor that will recognize human cells, because those are the ones that we should probably flag. And then another part that's, that's really not happening is really looking at early detection of pathogens that spill over. And this will be typically into your livestock um, and into humans. Um, we don't have that surveillance in place. And it's, it's usually a pocket where it will spill over. If you can find that pocket early, 
you can prevent or you can make the effect of that outbreak much less. And this, we need to understand what the pathogens are to really look at early detection and know what the spillover risks are to decide what to test for and where to test for. And this, this is not at the moment where we are. We're still here at the basics. Then I've, I've looked at, I've, I discussed some of the papers saying the reasons for spillover, but there's also a host factor that we cannot ignore. So it is important that we do longitudinal studies in animals because there may be changes in infection dynamics based on the life um, history, their movement, there may be some resistance or tolerance to pathogens, and all of these things have got a direct influence on the frequency of exposure. So we also need to understand that, and a, a lot of the, the recent studies are starting to incorporate this and understanding the value of understanding these dynamics in the reservoir host or potential reservoir host and how it will influence um, exposure. But then the thing that we're not doing is understanding this human-animal interface. And, and this is where I think we really need to ask questions on how to incorporate this into the bigger picture. There needs to be contact. So we need to really understand human behavior. We need to address the anthropogenic factors. We first probably have to understand what the important anthropogenic factors are in very specific geographic locations where we have a potential of spillover. But then we also need to address it, and this includes the animal markets, the wildlife trade, climate change, biodiversity, and all the land use changes caused by different reasons. And then also going the extra step. We, we don't want to look back in 10 years and say there was a serology paper out indicating that people can maybe get infected by these viruses. There was no mitigation strategies. There was no community engagement, education. And that part is also really becoming important from the beginning of the studies till the end, really trying to limit that that risk in communities and in societies by communication. So why do we want to do this? And there's been a, a nice recent paper out, lots of limitations, it's all predictions, on cost savings. So if you look at the expenditures on preventative measures in the top part, if you look at monitoring wildlife trade, reduced spillovers, early detection, reduced spillovers in livestock, reducing deforestation by half, which has also got an additional benefit um, on the environment that you can actually um, put into um, money value. Um, that is about 22 to 31 billion. If we look at what we think COVID is gonna cost us, it goes to trillions. So basically the bottom line of this paper is prevention, if we do the prevention activities as, as we're already doing, and if we actually up that a little bit and spend more time and more resources on that, we can reduce the fact that COVID can maybe happen again with only 2% of the resources that COVID is costing us currently. So it, it starts making sense in terms of economics. And then just to end off, um, there's lots of documents of how, on how to do this. Species biodiversity, um, endangered species in wild fauna, um, how to be, protect species. There's lots of these documents that brings everything together in a one health um, setting where we look at environment, animals, and human health. But a lot of it is, is unfortunately still documents. So, so I think we're at the point where we really need to look at an international and national effort on how we're going to address this practically. And all of this ultimately leading to sustainable development goals that we've also got guidelines for. So all of this really needs to become practice on the ground, and it, it doesn't just depend on political will. It, it is really about individuals that needs to make a mindset change, scientists and research programs that needs to make a mindset change to incorporate this, even though it's challenging, even though it's difficult, it needs to bring all these concepts together as far as possible, um, and bring in multidisciplinary teams to really look at the full picture and not just testing bats and say we're going to have an outbreak because there's a source related virus in a bat. It's, it's not going to help us to not have the next pandemic. The reality is there will be a next pandemic. If you look at the history, there will. So we cannot ignore this and we cannot be in this situation again where um, we have to spend trillions on preventing an outbreak, but we could have spent billions to maybe 
just reduce the risk and not have these outbreaks. And that's the end of, of my talk. I just want to thank the university. It's always been, always been um, supplying adequate resources. The NRF um, that allows me to do this work continuously through the South African Research Chain Initiative and specifically the Department of Science and Innovation that funds this research. And then international agencies like the CDC, Centers for Disease Control in the USA, who provide specific funding to develop capacity to detect zoonotic diseases that allows us to now take this work forward. And the Biological Threat Reduction Pro Program of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency in the USA, who is currently really funding this research to move it into this next phase of looking at the bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Markotar. Wanda, this was exciting. This was very relevant in the times we're living. Um, thank you for a really uh, thought-provoking presentation. We received a few questions online, if you don't mind. I'm going to read the first one from Samuel Arthur Dadzi. What accounts for a relatively low death rates in African from COVID-19 when all the health systems in Africa are not par with uh, the more industrialized economies? So, so that's a very interesting question, a very challenging question to answer. Um, I think the short answer is we don't know yet, but there's hints to, to certain factors. One of them is age. We're sitting with a, a much younger population if you look at our, our um, average age in Africa, so if age is a very determining factor in seeing mortality, that might be one of it. It's not been really tested. There's been very interesting studies done in Europe where there's certain genetic elements that seems to play a role in how severe the disease is. And it's also linked to blood groups, um, very interesting. And those type of studies has not really been done for Africa. So we are to mm. see that data, um, maybe in the future, and I know then one of the things I thought from the beginning of the outbreak, and I saw Shabir Mahdi was also in agreement with me that that could maybe be a reason, um, is that we exposed to so many coronaviruses. So do we maybe have a pre-existing immunity? But, but to test that, we need samples going back and really have a controlled study to mm -hmm. see if it's actually going to be the case. So time will tell. Maybe we do have an advantage. Maybe there's other reasons why it's happening. I think we've got time for another question. This one is by Tetsun Nguana, and he's asking, in the context of Africa, where research capacity and resources are still lacking, what can be done by existing academic institutions to intensify the call for disease surveillance? So going back to my talk, I don't think it's just about disease surveillance. So, so I think the message is that we really need to rethink, and I'm, I'm privileged to be at an institution that's very forward thinking in terms of multidisciplinary research, also putting resources into it. Um, we've got Future Africa, we've got several other initiatives, um, but we really need to bring multidisciplinary teams together where we use the resources to answer several different questions. We're not in the position anymore where we can use all our resources to focus just on surveillance. We need to bring somebody in that knows land use changes, that knows human behavior. And in that process, you're going to get the answers. Thank you. There's more questions coming in, but I'm sure you will um, attend to it online and we'll give feedback and answer these questions. Uh, so keep tuned and uh, this uh, lecture will also be available online. I've seen somebody ask specifically for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to now uh, hand over to Professor Coupe uh, to do the thanks and the closure. But Professor VC, thank you from our side as well for hosting events like this mm -hmm. and showcasing the good work that the staff at the University of Pretoria is doing. Mm -hmm. Over to you. 
Thank you, Professor Tian Diaha. And thank you, of course, very much, uh, Professor Vanda Makota. I think I have uh, abused you twice this year <laughs> to drag you to show and throw light into these uh, matters. I think it's very important. Also, I like what uh, your emphasis on the, towards your end of the slides, where are the gaps in the research and what kind of research do we need to do to, if you like, square the circle and produce really the insightful answers. Universities, as you rightly said, would like to support this kind of research going forward, transdisciplinary kind of research through our various platforms like Future Africa, Engineering for and the center that you, you've been running. So we're really grateful that you can. This is, I didn't need not say to anybody, this is a global threat. <laughs> and anyone who can bring answers to this mm -hmm. will contribute to the sustainability of humanity and the environment and also the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. So we're really grateful and strength to your mind and to <laughs> the groups that you work with and to the collaborators that you work with. Yeah. Okay. And uh, also to the faculty, Dean, I think ho hosting these kinds of centers is vital to our strategy and contribution to South Africa, Africa, and the world. And thanks okay. to everybody who listened to this expert lecture. Unfortunately, the year has run out if the year wasn't running out, we would host another expert lecture. We did earlier in the year. This was the second of the year. More coming next year, so join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. A seed planted today takes root and grows into a tree that bears fruit in the future. Over 110 years ago, a seed was planted. Today, that seed, the idea of excellence, has grown into the University of Pretoria, South Africa's largest contact research-intensive university. Nine faculties and a business school are spread across seven beautiful campuses which are home to over 50,000 students ready to make an impact in the world beyond university and join our global network of nearly 300,000 alumni. Future-focused, sustainably developed facilities and cutting-edge multi- and transdisciplinary research are underpinned by a desire to transform lives and have a positive impact on communities and the world. Excellence in teaching, learning, research innovation, arts and culture, and sports puts us firmly amongst the world's best universities. Knowledge is not just what is in books, it is the wisdom to apply it, to nourish and nurture the seed so that it takes root, grows tall, bears fruit and branches out. UP plants that seed that tiny bit of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, hope, the desire to care, respect, help, and innovate against all odds. To grow, to leave your mark, to excel, to challenge the norm, to think, to rethink, to discover, to inquire, to lead, to have courage, to make a difference, and to persevere. This is the University of Pretoria. We make today and every day matter.